All right, welcome to another episode of Around the County with Supervisor Jim Desmond. I'm Miles Himmel, Communications Director for District 5. Today, we've got a special guest with us, Dr. Karen Randall from Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, and you may be thinking, why are we going to Pueblo, Colorado? Well, we'll answer that here in a second. But Dr. Randall, first, if you don't mind, uh, give us your credentials of, of who you are. Oh, okay. I'm a trained in emergency medicine, pediatrics, and family practice. I spent years teaching um, medicine in a hospital, a big hospital system in Detroit at a level one. And then I decided to slow down. So I moved to Colorado in 2013, the year before they legalized. And based on all the things that I've seen with legalization, I actually went back and got a certificate in cannabis science and medicine. Um, and that's part of my credentials. And that's where I'm at. Pueblo, Colorado, maybe people listening right now, you know, in our district to go, well, why do I care what's going on in Pueblo versus <laughs> San Diego County? What's why? I, you know, I've read some of the quotes that you've been in and some of the articles. Pueblo, Colorado legalized marijuana, kind of went all in on marijuana. Can you describe what that was like and then what the past years have been like? Oh, we totally went all in. So everybody would just say, where is Pueblo? Because I would say that, but it's a really nice group that I'm practicing with here, but Pueblo went all in on marijuana. In fact, our former county commissioner called us the Napa Valley of Cannabis. We were going to, he promised the city all kinds of improvements and all kinds of money from tax revenue um, based on establishing and, and propagating and growing marijuana. So I think currently in our county of 160,000 people, we have um, probably it's probably more than 50 retail stores, retail and, and medicine stores, as you have it. Um, we also have over 100 legal grows and we have countless illegal grows. Um, so that's where we're at with a county of 160,000 people. Um, looking at from a medicine perspective, I checked, I didn't check during the COVID event because I think that that really alters, um, it alters what people insurance can have. And I think that's like, in conditions that are beyond our control. But in 2018, um, in our county of 160,000, 69,000 of our citizens have Medicaid. Um, and 44% of the people living in the city of Pueblo itself were on some sort of state of disability. So that tells you the economic basis for the community. It's not super high. Um, the community was told that they would make a lot of tax revenue. I know that that's what you've been told. We'll make tax revenue. People are doing it and selling it anyway. So we might as well get in on the tax revenue. And so from the medical perspective, all I can do is speak to the harms that we've seen in the community. So we've seen like not only environmental harms and community harms, but what we really see and what I have seen is medical harms. And the cost of these medical harms is just enormous. Well, what do you what do you see as the medical harms? Is is it you know? I guess I I'm I'm a I'm a layman. I'm not, I'm not a med medical doctor at mm -hmm. right all. But you know, it's still a gateway drug to me. And are you seeing that as a gateway drug? Oh, or clearly, yes, it's a gateway drug. And if you look up the NISDA study, and you look up the Healthy Kids survey, you can see that our youth are definitely starting younger, and without question, our youth usage has gone up more. Um, the industry didn't tell the communities that what they're really pushing is the high concentrated dab, wax, and shatter. So they're extracting these and making dab, wax, and shatter. And really for the community, their basic person, what you have to know is that in the 1990s and earlier, a cannabis, a single marijuana joint had two to three milligrams of THC. Currently, what the industry is pushing, dab, wax, and shatter, or concentrates, there's like 67% um, THC. So if you get a gram, it's 670 milligrams of THC. And you can buy it with that even has more concentration, more concentration of THC. I've seen up to 90%. Some even claim 99% THC extracted. That doesn't resemble the cannabis plant itself at all, but you're talking about an enormous increase in concentration. So what happens is, our youth are starting, so we'll start with the youth because that's my area of concern, is that the youth are starting earlier. So they're vaping products because it's easier to vape, it's easier to hide, it's odorless. There are all kinds of vape pins and ways to vape without 
people recognizing it. There's even a sweatshirt hoodie and in the string of the hoodie sweatshirt is a vape pin so that you can hide your vape in your shirt and vape just by sucking on the end of your shirt string. So clearly the products are meant to deceive. Youth are using more and so because it's easier and it's odorless, they're using these concentrates. So what it means is our youth are using higher concentrates at an earlier age. Um, there's no question that when you look at long-term studies done in Europe, um, in New Zealand, that the, the younger you use and the more you use, the more likely you are to have long-term outcome problems with social behavior, problems with psychosis, um, problems with uh, suicidal ideation. So we know that this is happening. And we also know now that our youth here, based on NISDA this year and Healthy Kids last year, they're using more. And sadly, what they're using is the high concentrate. So if we look at that problem alone, that should concern your communities. And it doesn't matter how you raise your kids. What I see here is kids using at an early age down to 10. I had a, a, a colleague who's a radiologist who thought his his daughter was in fourth grade. He was going to give her the talk about using drugs and cannabis. And she said, oh, I, I already used that last year. She was nine. Wow. And so we see kids who are in elementary school now using, and again, it's products made to be hidden easily. Um, the other thing that we see with kids is accidental and intentional overdose. Um, for us, the new thing has been these kids can get on Snapchat. And when they're on Snapchat, they set up because uh, it goes away after a certain amount of time. So the dealer will mark a location and the kids can go and get whatever they want from Snapchat. And um, I had two girls, 12 and 14, come in uh, less about a month ago. And each, they had gotten a TH, medicated THC nerds rope. So it looks just like a nerds rope, same packaging. You would really have to look to see that had 500 milligrams of THC in it. And each child ate half. So they obtained it using the internet, went to the wherever the dealer said he was going to be and bought a 500 milligram THC candy and both ate half. And they ended up in the ED for a prolonged stay. Going back again, why is that important? 500 milligrams versus the old joints of one to three milligrams of, can of, of THC. So, I mean, this is happening all the time. Um, there are a lot of candies and products here being made to look very similar. And I can send you pictures very similar to the products that are being sold over the counter, like um, Pop-Tarts and the Nerds ropes. And uh, there is some Skittle packaging. And um, there was a recent bust in Alabama um, by the DEA of people who were advertising on the internet for products that were available and the kids could buy. And it was all candies that were al altered with THC. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. It sounds like though, this doesn't really have much to do, I guess, with the allowing the dispensaries to operate because most of this sounds like it's, you know, under the table or, or you know, a, a, well, you know it, a, a, the dark it, market or something like that. I don't, um, it is the dark market and you guys legalize. So you're going to have dark market, whether you have stores in your dispense in your, in your city or not. Um, the, the, my understanding was these kids bought from a retail store out the back door. Oh, uh, huh. Wow. Yeah. So, um, so there then, is a connection, there is a connection between, I guess, having dispensaries and the black market, I guess it's doing. Right. There is. Okay. And, um, I have a long-term study here that I've done you, all the urine drug screens done in our emergency department. We're the only level two ER south of this Colorado Springs. So all of Southern Colorado and Northern um, New Mexico. So we do urine drug screens on people who have psychiatric complaints or MVAs. And I've kept a log of all of those done in the emergency department over the last eight years. And what we saw was not only did uh, the obvious use of cannabis go up, I mean, it like quadrupled or, or went even higher. Um, we also saw an increase in opioids. We saw an increase in methamphetamine. Our methamphetamine use in the community, or at least in my urine drug screen study, um, it increased 256% in the last seven years. And I sent you that article. I sent you our presentation that we did um, at a meeting not too long ago. Um, so we all drug usage increased. We had an increase in opioids. 
um, for the first six or seven years, and then it tapered off a little bit, but still never even came close to baseline. So then if you look at the problems that we're seeing medically from adults, so if you, it doesn't, you don't have to look far to realize that you're going to be hit with commercials that say, billboards that say it's wonderful, you're going to have ads in newspapers that say it treats everything from toenails to asthma to eczema to GI symptoms, etc. And so in general, because the, the harms are being downplayed, people are using more because it's legal, right? So it's, it's legal, it's here, I bought it from the dispensary um, or I went to get my medicine. And so they're using more. And what we're seeing now medically, and I think the term came actually from San Diego was scrometine. So we see people who are adults and young adults who are using cannabis products um, usually it's the smoked or the concentrated um, products, and they have just repetitive cycles of vomiting. And initially, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I remember that it was so unusual to have what we call hyperemesis from cannabis, that it was a case report, and now we see it every single day. And if you want to talk about cost to the community, what happens is these people will come in repeatedly to the emergency department for repeated scans, IV medicines, the typical medicines that treat nausea and vomiting don't work well with um, the hyperemesis from cannabis. So they get um, different types of medicine. They often get scans. They often get evaluation and scopes. And so if they come into the emergency department, not counting admissions and not counting consults, just to come in, get treated, get IVs, get medications and get discharged if they have plus or minus studies, the average cost on the low side is about $5,000. And if you say, I'm seeing a patient every single day in my system, which is probably estimated low, um, that's $5,000 a day times 325 days takes you up to almost $2 million. And then you have to understand we have 25 ERs in Colorado. So there you go. It's just, I'm just cost shifting. Where are the taxpayers going to pay their money? They're the, the Medicaid costs have gone up tremendously. So um, your community won't benefit from the taxes. And then, so we're not only seeing that, we're seeing a marked uh, an increase in acute psychosis. And looking forward, what several studies, the, there was a big study done by NIDA. Um, it's called the ABCD study. And they actually are doing, as kids are from across the country, and they're looking at parental drug use and with childhood outcomes. And I think they have 11,000, almost 12,000 students, um, children enrolled in this. And they've seen that if they isolate out for just parental cannabis use, so if the mother continued to use cannabis after finding out she was pregnant, there's a marked increase in social dysfunction in the children. So um, behavioral issues, social issues, and we've definitely seen that in offspring of people who are users um, here. And the youngest one I saw with what they call explosive rage disorder was five. Um, offspring of drug users, parents nowhere in the scene. She's living with her older grandparents. And the problem community-wise, so you can put these stores in and you can sell. But the problem is, is that we don't have any place to put these kids for rehab. There's none. Our rehabs have closed up. We had a an adolescent rehab here that closed. Um, we're very, very limited. So we're increasing the presence of THC, which in my book is extremely addictive when you're talking about concentrates. And we're starting kids in elementary school. And then should they decide that that's a problem and they want treatment, I don't have a place to put them. And hmm. our community is not better. We're definitely not richer. Um, I think that the industry made a, uh, gosh, they said they were going to pay for scholarships. So they give some scholarships to kids to stay in Pueblo area to go to college here. And that's nominal. It's a thousand dollars for a student. It's nominal. But when you can talk about the amount of damage being done, we don't have places for these kids to go to rehab. So they end up, Just they end up using because they don't have an option. Well, one of the, one of the things I keep hearing you know, for, especially from politicians, and I am one, but it, is that the medical benefit in these people, you know, they use it to calm their nerves or calm or deal with COVID or, or do these other things. <laughs> but the medical profession 
I, I've always thought, well, okay, if it's a if it's a medicine, then why doesn't why can't you know, I guess it's because the federal government won't allow it to be dispensed in pharmacies. I mean, if a doctor really prescribes it and thinks, okay, a person could benefit from it, we don't have that mechanism in place, do we? Or, or, or we we don't. And and so I'll say a couple of things about that. First of all, there was no other medicine that I'm aware of that the country voted on that we should have this as a medicine. Second of all, for centuries, people have been using another substance to deal with stress, to deal with anxiety, and we call that alcohol, right? But we don't call it medicinal alcohol. That's weirdly enough, we don't call it medicinal alcohol. So they've been using that for years to treat PTSD, stress, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. And yet that's not been declared a medicine. No one voted on whether we should have medicinal alcohol. I don't know of any other medicine where we say, oh, go down and let a bud tender just prescribe what type of cannabis he thinks you should use and what quantity, and there's no quantity limits. So uh, we have the PDMP, the, uh, I'm sure you guys have it too, where you can record any narcotics that are to be recorded. Um, so opiates are recorded. If I prescribe it, it goes into the prescription yeah. drug monitoring program. And so, um, or if I prescribe, like say people take Adderall. So if those are prescribed, it's all in the prescription drug monitoring. Well, as far as I know, the schedule hasn't changed for cannabis. It's a schedule one narcotic and we don't have it in our PDMP. So there's no way for me to find out what dose the patient's taking, who prescribed it. Is somebody following this patient up? The patient's probably 99.9 .9 times out of 100 can't tell you who the name of the prescriber was um, and they don't have follow-up. They're not being given instructions with regards to interactions. And we know there's more and more interactions with cannabis and medications that we're taking chronically. So these people aren't being given instructions. And I think the biggest, um, the biggest issue where I'm seeing that now is with older patients, right? They're being blasted with information about how it CBD will take care of your arthritis. It will make you feel young and youthful, use as much as you want. And there's no there's no limit. So these people are going and buying CBD, which is THC, right? It comes from the, can the plant cannabis sativa, regardless of whether you call it hemp or THC, it, it all has to do with the ratio of CBD to THC, but the plant it comes from is called cannabis sativa ruderalis. That's its scientific name. And no matter how good you are, whatever you extract from CBDC, there's still THC. And we have older people just putting this on with abandon and having side effects from that. Well, has, so, has the political, I know you're in medicine, but has the political will changed at all in Pueblo? Because the it's, this isn't the panacea they thought it was going to be by, by adopting. Yeah, I think we, we attempted to reverse this. So each city um, or a county, I guess, in Colorado could opt out. And most, I would say over 50% of our counties opted out. And I think you have the same in California. And we did attempt to reverse it. Once the people realized this was like, basically not a good thing, we tried to over, over um, rule it and, and put it out, but we weren't able to do that. And it was a very close margin. It was like 53 to 47 against. So I mean, they're still working and it's uh, the way it was written, it's in our constitution. So it'd take a big effort to, to put it out. And unfortunately, because I'm just, I do this, um, I got educated, I spoke, I, I have spoken worldwide in Portugal, in Australia, all over the US. And I do it usually at my own cost. I don't have millions of dollars financially backing me. And unfortunately, you know, if you're a politician, you know how it goes when you lobby and you have tons of money that you can put towards it. And so we're fighting that. And so, yeah, the community tried and we weren't successful because so they were actually buying people or telling them they could have a joint, a free joint if they voted. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so hard uh, to beat that, right? Well, and technically in San Diego County, cities in San Diego County have opted and, and said, okay, matter of fact, the majority of the cities have. I represent a big chunk of the unincorporated area, the counties. And where uh -huh. right now we have the county areas, there's a couple of dispensaries grandfathered in, but they're banned uh, pretty much uh, overall. But they can get it delivered. They can get it, you know, it's it's not like it's-, it's amazing, not, yeah. You, you can still get it. I just don't, I, I take the opinion that I don't want a dispensary in my backyard 
I don't want one in your, you know, I don't want one near you. I don't want, you know, so I don't want to put one near you either. But it just doesn't seem to be the panacea for, for taxes and everything else. That it, that and I haven't seen that. And I haven't seen the community benefits. So um, when the reporter came by, I took her through and I took her through downtown Pueblo. And I said, when we go through the town, the mall is failing. So almost every store at the mall is closed. Crime is sky high. I saw a report that said crime in Pueblo is down, but it's like somehow, how could crime be down when our murder rate almost doubled? And like we have car break-ins, et cetera, that, that I'm, I'm the feet on the street and the cops are the feet on the street and we're seeing all kinds of crime. And so like having this in the environment, now we're seeing more break-ins at, at um, dispensaries. So we're having to use police force for the break-ins. And it has not been the panacea that the community wanted. And all I can say is, if you have a question about how well it's done, because we're the Napa Valley of cannabis, come and take a drive through Pueblo and see if it looks like a city that has raked the benefits of seven years of cannabis legalization. That's all you have to do. Come take a look. And then spend a day with me. I can't tell you how many politicians I've come, I've asked to spend a day with me because I see the end point of all this legalization and uh, it just has to be one day because there's not a day that I don't see a problem related to cannabis. And it's like, come spend a day with me. Well, we, we're kind of running out of time here. Might as well to wrap us up. This is, Doctor, you've been great. Thank you so much for your wisdom and, and, and uh, the time you've taken for us today. Uh, oh, you're welcome. I, I was just going to ask you. I mean, you pretty much summed it up there. Do you have a Do you have a real life story? A, a I mean, obviously, no names or anything, but of of a youth, of a someone, or what it's like, kind of in a day in day out in your hospital. Just kind of open open question like oh, that. Oh yeah, I have lots of stories. Um, like some of the more horrific ones was a woman who was smoking cannabis and got a young woman got psychotic, um, stabbed her two kids put them in the car and drove off a bridge with the attempt to kill everybody. Um, I saw a 12 and 14 year old girl who took the cannabis candy that they bought out the back door of a dispensary and were high. I saw an 11 year old kid who was um, his, uh, the, the offspring of people who use cannabis um, or drugs. It's hard to isolate now because drugs are so ubiquitous here. But this kid had emotional disorder and they called it like, again, it was like emotional outburst or anger disorder and uh, rage disorder. And he said, I have these blackouts. And then I chase my family members. He was chasing his family members around the day that I saw him with poultry shears in an attempt to kill them. He was 11. And by the time I saw him, he had snapped out of this rage that he's like, I, you know, who's to say this kid won't end up in a mall with an AK-47 at some point. And the problem is, is that we simply don't have enough mental health to take care of the people and the kids that are being created through parents who've had drug use and the people themselves who are becoming psychotic or disenfranchised from drug use. Wow. Well, well thank you very much, Dr. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. I come spend a day with you, but that's pretty far a trip here from San Diego to come to Pueblo. But I appreciate uh, your your insight and your input, and, and um, you know, especially in this time of COVID, I, like I said earlier, there's so much anxiety out there, and people are dealing with it. Unfortunately, using drugs and alcohol, and and uh, you know, they think they're they're helping themselves, but they're really not. So it, right, and and that the problem is, is that once you start that, and especially once you your kids are seeing their parents use, right? And so they're normalizing drug usage. And once the kids start using, you're automatically shutting so many doors for them. They can't be in the military. They can't be, you know, they can't do what I do because I could get drug tested. They can't do what nurses do. So you're automatically closing all these doors for these kids. And I don't think they're realizing it. All right.